Okay, so we verified that when we calculate our accelerations of our model, we get uh, reasonable values or get the, the value that we expect for the, the forces that we applied to the model. And we verified that when we give the model a certain prescribed pose and we plot that pose, it looks realistic. And when we change that pose, the model changes its pose in the way that we expect. Um, so now we're ready to not just look at the model in a static pose, we're ready to look at the evolution of the pose dynamically over time as uh, forces and moments are applied to it. We're ready to uh, start from a prescribed initial pose, um, apply some forces to the model, and compute how the uh, pose of the model changes in response to those forces over time. In other words, we're ready to perform a forward dynamic simulation with the model. So how do we do that in practice? Well, we first need to convert this function of equations of motion, or this script for equations of motion to a function. So I'm gonna rename it func here. And what is this function gonna do? It is going to calculate xp, which is the rate at which the model states are changing. And it's gonna do that given time and the current values of those states. Okay, so we're no longer going to be in this function prescribing the values of the states, although I will use these prescribed states as my initial conditions, so we're gonna save those. Um, now the states of the model will be input to it every time we call up this function from this input vector of states. The first time we call up that function, that input vector will be my um, initial values that I just copied away. It'll then be computing how quickly those values are changing and updating them for the next time step, the next time that it calls up this function. Okay, so I've got my states. Um, my forces are still gonna be set to zero for now. Um, my mass matrix is calculated the same way. My forcing vector is calculated the same way. Acceleration is calculated the same way. Um, I no longer want to do any plotting in this function because I'll be calling up this function a lot. I don't want to make a plot every time. And I'm still going to need some of these positions in that function. I'll definitely need them out here to make the plots. And eventually, not, not now, but eventually in this function, when we uh, define the contact forces, we're going to need these kinematics of the uh, 0.4 there at the end of the shank. So we'll leave those in there. We're not going to use them uh, immediately, but we'll use those eventually. But for now, we'll just leave them in there. Um, remember here, my goal is to calculate the rate at which the states are changing. Um, the accelerations down here give me the rates at which the velocities are changing. Um, the velocities themselves give me the rates at which the positions are changing. And so for convenience here, I'm just going to plug those into a vector. And then way down here at the bottom, I'm going to output my rates at which my states are changing xp. That's going to be my velocities and my accelerations. And that's all there is to it. Okay, now I need to write up a script that calls that function within the context of a numerical uh, ordinary differential equation solver in MATLAB. So let's write that script. find some simulation settings first. Um, let's do a simulation of movement of one second. And let's have it tell us the results every millisecond. got our model states there and these are going to be our initial states. And we'll call that vector of initial states 
x naught. I'm going to set some options for the integrator. In particular, it's uh, accuracy settings. Um, the meaning of these uh, integrator error tolerance here, adds tall and rel tall, was largely outside the scope of this class. You'd have to take a, a class in numerical methods to really uh, dig into those. Um, long story short is the smaller that you make these values, the um, more accurate the numerical solution is going to be, or the, the, the closer of an approximation to the, the true but unknown analytical solution it's going to be. Um, but also the smaller that you make them, the longer the integration is going to take, the, the more it's going to have to iterate to, to try to find a, a solution that meets these accuracy bounds. And the um, more likely you are to have it not actually meet those bounds. If you make this too small, it'll never be able to, to actually uh, converge onto a solution that's deemed accessible within those bounds. So these are parameters you want to play around with a little bit. Um, they're good ones to um, adjust if you are running simulations and it seems like everything is coded correctly and you're just getting results that seem like they're clearly not right. Um, it's possible that you might have the uh, error tolerance is here uh, set to, to too big of a number. Um, if you're running the uh, integrator and it just never converges or, or never uh, finishes, then it's possible that you have these set to, to too small of a value. Um, for our types of simulations, I recommend starting with these fairly small or uh, fairly uh, uh, strict accuracy tolerances here of uh, 1 to the negative 8th and then going from there and making it uh, bigger if necessary. But these are good places to start at least for, uh, for simple models like this. Okay, we are now ready to integrate the model's state equations which is a fancy way of saying actually perform the simulation. I'm going to output a vector of time and a vector of states at those times. Um, I think ODE 15S is the one I like to use. And our function is going to be Kines 79W func. And we're going to do this from 0 to T with those initial states and those options. Okay, before we plot anything, let's run this and see if it actually runs. And I'll call this Kines 789W go. Didn't like something. Okay, dimension of arrays being concatenated or not consistent. This is a pretty common problem that you'll have um, unless you're a, a MATLAB savant, which I'm not really. Um, it expects the output of my function here, xp, to be a column vector, so a, a, a 1 by 10 vector, and it's telling me that it's not a column vector. So to figure out what it's unhappy about, let's have it print the size of XP to the screen. And it did not do that. So let's just take a guess and say that one of these is pointing in the wrong direction. Not that one. How about that one? Not that one. Let's see if it'll be happy if I stack them. Still not happy. How about if I transpose just velocity and stack them? Okay, there it was happy. Um, this time it's not running because it doesn't know what my parameters are. So let's go have my Go script know my model parameters. 
Okay, now we're all set. Okay, so what that did was it set up everything here, told it how long it's simulating things for, uh, gave it the initial state, gave it some options, and then uh, actually did the numerical integration of the state equation. Started from this initial pose, um, applied these forces and gravity to the model, and then computed its pose as a function of time while those forces were applied to it over that one second. Now, what should we expect to see here? Well, if the model just starts in some initial pose up in the air, and there's nothing, no forces at all acting on it except for gravity, it should just maintain that pose but fall straight down towards the ground, right? And let's see if that's what we actually get. Um, I'm going to label my output states here. Q1 is going to be X1. And same deal for all of my states. Now I'm going to calculate my points of interest and plot my model's pose. Only this time I'm going to plot its pose as a function of time. a little bit of a movie here, each time redrawing the pose of my model every time it loops through there. Okay, I believe there's one more command that I have to give it here that I'm not quite remembering, so let's go and look at my old code and see what that is. Uh, I have to clear it. That's right. Okay, so this is going to plot every uh, tenth time step of my model here. I do that just for uh, speed purposes. Otherwise, it's it's very slow. Not not slow in terms of computing, but just the movement is is very slow and kind of uninteresting. Um, at each one of those time steps, it's going to draw on the screen the current pose of the model. Um, it's then going to pause, and as long as it's not at the uh, last time step, it's going to clear the figure and then loop back and draw it again. So we should see an animation here of the model moving that if our expectation is correct, it should just fall from the sky uh, straight downward. And let's see if that's what we get. Something didn't like something. What are you unhappy about? Oh, I did not index my output state here correctly. My state is a 1001 by 10 vector. So I need to tell it all 1001 values there, not just the first one. Let's see if this one gets us what we want. And there we go. So as expected, our model fell straight down. You can see it's falling fairly fast. Um, we can do a couple more checks here to see if our model is behaving as expected. Um, gravity on the moon, I believe, is one-sixth of on the Earth, so let's simulate lunar gravity here. What would the model do if it was falling on the moon? We would expect it to probably fall slower. And it indeed falls a lot slower on the moon. Um, let's set gravity to zero here. And it should just hang in space. And it 
does indeed hang in space. And let's apply some torques to the model. Let's supply a hip flexion torque and a small knee flexion torque. And we should get some movement. There we go. Flexing the hip and the knee. And let's just go crazy and apply some forces to the model, negative 10 newtons and positive 20 newtons upward. And let's just go ahead and turn gravity back on and see what we get. So we can now simulate motion with our model. fun things like make these forces enormous and get the model to blast off the screen there. So now we have the ability to start the model from some initial pose, apply forces and moments to it, and simulate its movement in space as a function of those forces and moments. Okay. Um, we're still not terribly realistic here in terms of a, a musculoskeletal sense. For example, when I simulate my model here, and was gravity on? Yeah, gravity was on. When I simulate my model here, it just falls straight down through the ground there, noted with the green line. Um, notice that there's nothing telling it that there's ground there. When the foot runs into the ground, nothing stops it. There's no contact there. Um, that's because this contact force applied to the foot is set to zero. Also we have nothing acting at the uh, kinetics of these joints here, of this hip joint and the uh, knee joint. We need to add in the uh, passive visoelasticity of the tissues that span that joint to give them some, some resistance to motion. And then we also need to add in the active contribution of the muscle forces to uh, producing torques at those joints. And that'll come from uh, replacing these uh, arbitrary zero values for tau with the differential equations of our, um, our muscle activation and contractile dynamics, along with some other functions uh, representing the passive uh, uh, visoelasticity of joint structures that we haven't talked about yet. So we're getting close. We have motion of the model that uh, moves dynamically as a function of forces applied to the model. Now we just need to realistically define these forces, contact forces in a biomechanical sense, and moments at the joints in a musculoskeletal uh, biomechanics sense. And that is what we will start into next time.